In California, where I am, this is just one of the most spectacularly beautiful days I have seen in a long time, and I had to come outside. I'm at the home of a very, very dear friend. I hope that the noises around me are not a distraction, but I could not stay inside today. And I want to talk to you about death to self, and that might sound like a strange thing to talk about on a beautiful day, but actually it's not at all. Uh, to be dead to self is to be alive to life in any sphere of life actually when we deny ourselves that is when we're willing to put aside what we would just feel like doing in pursuit of something nobler we come alive to something greater i just got a text from a good friend of mine mark a lot of you might know mark we used to work together mark's now living in portugal mark's one of these amazing guys very gifted artist and the way that you become an artist whose gifts are honed is you spend time practicing and sketching and drawing and learning. And through that process, you are free to create in beautiful ways. Mark was always in an amazing shape. Mark has muscles where I don't even have places. We would play basketball and he would be able to run fast breaks up and down the court until everybody else was puking. Good for you, Mark. And now he's in Portugal. We got somebody who's in the Fellowship of the Withered Hand in Portugal. Hope you're doing great. But that's a picture in art, in athletics, in every way. It is through the process of death to self, which is just simply being willing to set aside what it is that I feel like doing in the pursuit of a nobler life, of a nobler self that allows transformation to happen. And this is particularly true when it comes to spiritual life. So we are working our way through the renovation of the heart. Dallas Willard talking about death to self. Page 71, Dallas writes, At the first, we must very self-consciously deny ourselves, reject the preeminence of what we want when and as we want it, and we must look to quite specific motions of God's grace in and around us to guide and strengthen us in our occasions of self-denial. We will also need a wise and constant use of disciplines for the spiritual life. This is because from where we start, the substance of ourselves formed in a world against God is ready to act otherwise in all its dimensions, especially in the social and bodily. So I'm simply ready to set aside what I feel like doing in the moment. A very simple way of doing this that might be helpful for you today is to observe what is sometimes called the 15-minute rule. When you find yourself with an urge or an impulse or a desire to do something and it strikes you that it might not be a good or healthy or God-honoring thing to do, like I want a drink of alcohol so that my um, uh, anxiety can be quelled, or I want to eat as a way of soothing my nerves, maybe eat something that I shouldn't, or I want to send off an angry me email to another person because I'm ticked off at them. Or I want to send an anxious text to somebody. Or I want to spend money because that will make me feel better even though I might regret it later on. Just pause. Wait 15 minutes. And then if you're still prepared to do it, you can do it at that point. But talk to God before then. And that's a tiny little practice through which I can uh, exercise the muscle of death to self, self-denial. So at first, we have to be quite self-conscious and intentional about this, Dallas writes. But there will come a time in the experience of the apprentice of Jesus when it is appropriate to speak of our being dead to self. There is no one way this comes to us, I think, and the language here must be handled carefully. It has been the source of much misunderstanding and harm in the past. But the fact that it represents a fundamental, indispensable element in the renovation of the heart and soul and life is true. Being dead to self, now here's the definition. Being dead to self is the condition where the mere fact that I do not get what I want does not surprise or offend me and has no control over me. Being dead to self is simply the condition in which the mere fact I don't get what I want doesn't surprise me 
hey, the world is supposed to give me what I want all the time. I'm not surprised by it. I'm not offended by it. There's got to be somebody I can sue. And most importantly, it does not have control over my life. Now, another way that we can practice this or open ourselves up to a life beyond uh, getting what I want is to be aware of God interrupting our lives at times. The more that I'm focused on getting what I want, I have to spend my time, my energy, getting done what I want in just the ways that I want to to be in control. Dietrich Bonhoeffer writes in his little book, Life Together, about the ministry of interruptions. Here's part of what he says. We must be ready to allow ourselves to be interrupted by God. God will be constantly crossing our paths and canceling our plans by sending people uh, with requests and problems to us. Strange to say, some people, even some ministers, get so busy with their own plans that they are unable to be interrupted even by God. And Bonhoeffer says in this way, they disregard the crooked but straight path of God. And now the Bible, really from beginning to end, among other things, is a book of interruptions. God interrupts Abraham and interrupts Isaac and interrupts David and interrupts Esther. One of Jesus' most famous stories is the story of the Good Samaritan. And the difference between him and the two people who thought they were quite religious was he was prepared to be interrupted. And when he saw somebody who had been beaten and was lying, bleeding and needy on the side of the road, he felt compassion. That is, his feelings were not dominated by the need to get done what he wanted to get done. And he was prepared to hand over some of his resources to help another person. That is death to self, but being alive to life. Dallas goes on, The one who is dead to self will certainly not even notice some things that other would. For example, things like social slights, verbal put-downs, innuendos, physical discomforts, but many other rebuffs to the dear self, as the philosopher Immanuel Kant called it, will be noticed often quite clearly. So you might look today for when are times when the demands of the dear self rears its head. One time I was asked to speak at my, the college that I graduated from, and when they were introducing me, one of the things they mentioned was that I played on the tennis team. And honestly, my immediate response, I'm not proud of this, was to think, played on the tennis team? Why didn't you tell them how well I played on the tennis team? Because lots of people played on the tennis team, but they might not have looked as good as what I did. Now, why did I want that to be said? Was it so that anybody else could be blessed? No, it was a possible opportunity to gain applause. That was just the concern of the dear self. And what a good thing it would be to be free of that. Just enslavement and garbage and the need for approval that keeps me from uh, lightness of spirit and being able to love and find God and find other people. So notice today when the dear self rears its ugly head. Dallas goes on. Do those persons who are dead, who easily and regularly deny themselves, have any mere sensitivity to self left? I think we'll never be without that. And then he talks about what it is to be dead to something. He says, when I was a child, I enjoyed shooting out an occasional street light or popping a stray cat with a BB gun. Pause for a moment. Seriously, Dallas Willard popping a stray cat with a BB gun? There's hope for me. Then he goes on. I confess that I am now completely dead to any attraction these activities once held for me. I have no feeling for them. See, to be dead to those things is not a painful condition. It's just sanity. It's just freedom. As I grew older, however, I became quite vain and dependent on what others thought and said about me. A major part of my spiritual struggle in my late teens and early 20s was with vanity. I wanted praise. In time, by God's grace, I became substantially, not totally, delivered. Through meditation on scripture, general study, solitude prayer, service to others, and just experience, along with movements of grace in my heart and soul. 
Perhaps I am rarely governed by vanity now. Others, of course, must be the judge of that. But it is still something I frequently feel, and I know it could be something that controls my feelings and behavior, were I to let it, or were God to abandon me to it. And I find this very helpful. Vanity, living for what others think about me or say about me, or how I look to them, is something that is still alive in me. But I found even the experience of the last couple years to bring a measure of freedom to it that I'm really grateful for. So as I walk through this day, I look for signs of the dear self. I wait 15 minutes before I just blindly follow an impulse. I watch for God to interrupt my path so that I can be increasingly dead to myself so that I can be increasingly alive to God and life. See you next time. Hey, thanks for joining us. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel and click the bell so you never miss an episode. There are emails that go along with each video. If you'd like to receive those, you can let us know at becomenew.me slash subscribe.